Welcome. A lot of people have asked me how to do pit fire from beginning to end, how to pick the right clay, how to prepare it, how to throw it, how to make it ready for the pit fire, how to actually do the fire, how to finish the pot. So in this video, I'm going to address the first part of it, how to pick the right clay, how to throw it, and how to prepare it for your actual pit fire. So let's move on with that. Theoretically, you can use all kinds of clay for pit fire. But it is a very brutal way of firing clay. Sort of like ragu can be. The raise in temperature and the drop in temperature is very rapid, and therefore not all clay will survive, at least theoretically. I have tried with porcelain, and I got away with it sometimes, and it can look really, really beautiful if you get away with it, but the risk is higher. Some people have asked me if you can use earthenware. And I think you can. I never did it myself. The, the thing about earthenware is that it melts at a much lower temperature than stoneware and porcelain. But a pit fire, a fire, doesn't get to the temperature where I would think, in most cases, the earthenware would melt. So it is safe from that. If you ever tried to, by accident, mix up earthenware and stoneware in a fire that reads like 1200-1300 degrees Celsius, you know exactly what I mean. This is an example of a pot I did a few years ago. It has been wood-fired. It is stoneware, but on a shelf above this there were also some pots, and one of them, by mistake, <laughs> was earthenware. And at 1300 degrees, cone 11, something like that, in, in a wood fire, earthenware melts. It becomes a glaze. And lucky for me, <laughs> it melted into this uh, bowl and actually created something really, really beautiful. It also destroyed one of the shelves, which was a bad side effect. So if you tried that, you know what I mean. But as I said, the fire, uh, in, a, in a live fire, uh, I don't think it's gonna reach temperature unless you pump in a lot of oxygen, in that case, maybe it will get too hot. I never used earthenware. Um, I only used stoneware in my own uh, workshop, and that's what I use for pit fire. Except a few times I do sneak in some uh, porcelain, and it looks beautiful, but the risk of cracking is just too high in my experience. So when it comes to uh, stoneware, basically you can have stoneware with grok and stoneware without grok. You can get some high grok stoneware that are, are made for raku, and those ones are probably going to be your most safe bet that will survive in uh, the pit fire. I have got away with stoneware with very little grok, but it is a little more safe with the higher grok stoneware. So if you go for uh, uh, raku stoneware, that should put you on your safe side. Less grok than that should also do. Most of the stoneware I use for pit fire have about 20-25% uh, small grog. And that seems to go fine. Very little of that is cracking. So the next question is the color of the clay. The colorants we use for pit fire are very fragile. They're not as strong and they don't put a layer like glaze do on top of your pot. So you're very dependent on the color of your surface. That's why porcelain can look so amazing if you get away with it, <laughs> in a pit fire, because it's super white. Most stoneware is not as white as porcelain. It is a buff or brownish color, and sometimes even darker. Uh, some stoneware is almost black, and you can get stoneware with a lot of uh, red iron that is more like a dark red. In general, I would recommend that you try and get as light a surface as possible, close to white, because then you have a sort of a clean canvas to work on with your pit fire colors. So if you can find a stoneware that is very light, that's a good starting point. On top of that, you can either add uh, slip, white slip, porcelain slip, or you can add terra sigillata that is made to be white. That can be done either by following uh, the recipe of the terra sigillata I'm using, which includes some EPK, uh, a porcelain, uh, uh, porcelain clay, uh, powdery clay that I put into it. 
Uh, there's a link somewhere, I will put it in the description too, for the recipe that I'm using now. Um, or you can use a combination of that. I also work a lot with a stoneware that is high on iron. So that makes it very red brownish. And it also has a lot of grog. It's actually 40%, but a very fine grog, so it doesn't feel very groggy. You can still get a super smooth surface. It is not specifically made for ragu or pit fire, but it is extremely strong. It can sustain almost any thermal shock. And one of the tests I once made with it is maybe the most brutal way of uh, firing anything you can do is of var. I don't know if you know that, uh, but it's, it's a technique where you heat up the pot typically in a ragu kiln. You take it out when it's warm and it have to be like 800, 900, 1000 degrees Celsius, which is like super hot. You take it out and you dip it into this, um, this mix of flour and yeast and water, uh, like a very, very watery type of dough. <laughs> uh, it's typically cold, so you go from 1000 degrees to maybe 10 degrees. That is a very dramatic shock to give any kind of clay and it have to be super, super strong to sustain that. But this is an example of uh, this clay that I used uh, for an Obvara test. I don't particularly like the, the, the outcome, the design of it, um, but some people do. And it was more to test to what extreme I could treat this clay, and this survived. So it is a very strong clay, and I never had any problem either when I do pit fire with this. Except, <laughs> because it have this dark surface, the very delicate colors of pit fire just are more difficult to stick to it. Um, it can be done. Uh, this is a, a vase I did some time ago, and you can see this is the, the dark uh, red um, clay, and uh, it actually came out really, really beautiful. But I have to say that I put a lot of very strong colorants, fluoric, uh, uh, ferric chloride, <laughs> uh, cobalt carbonate, uh, uh, cobalt uh, sulfate and, and a few more things, some um, copper wire around it. You can see the stripes here. So I used the strongest colorants that I can use in a pit fire. And that made it come out, I think, very beautiful. But I would normally recommend that you, um, that you pick a more light surface to work on. Uh, so most of the, uh, the, the, the pots that I've done for pit fire have been done with a light, buffy kind of uh, stoneware. It's also from George and Snyder, it's called uh, 254. Uh, it's relatively cheap and very nice to throw in. And it's got 25% grog. Um, and uh, this is an example of, um, of how that comes out. And you can see compared to this one, uh, the more light and delicate colors just come out stronger on a pot like this. And uh, I really like the results of this. To get a easy start with your, with your pit fire pottery, I suggest either you take a very light stoneware with some grog in it, or you take a, another stoneware <laughs> and you apply a slip, porcelain, or tercicolata, or a combination thereof, and, um, and use that as a starting point. In this uh, video, I'm going to throw a few pots um, to um, show you what to do. Um, there's a few things you need to keep in mind when throwing for pit fire. I'm going to use um, some of the buff clay I have, the, the 254. I'm also going to use some of the red clay because I'm going to show you, um, and actually I'm going to do some experiments in this video too. I'm going to show you how you can make the surface of these uh, darker clays uh, more light and suitable for pit fire. Sorry, I had to run out and do some other stuff. But now I'm back, and as you see, it's uh, dark now. Um, but I'm ready to throw. But before I start throwing, I want to talk a little bit about shapes. Because not all shapes are created equal, so to speak. Some shapes are more difficult to get through pit fire in one piece. This sort of shape is, uh, in my experience, one of the easiest ones to get good results with. It's a, 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 a straight form, it's got a big hole in the top, and uh, so the heat can you know, get in and out. and, and can, can heat it up equally. Uh, so this is a good shape, in my experience, or at least an easy shape. I also did a lot of these with narrow necks. They also tend to be okay, but sometimes not, and they are a little more fragile in the neck. Um, and of course the heat cannot you know, get in and out as quickly. 
So a little more fragile, but still I have a high success rate. I've also done quite a few bowls and they can come out so beautiful. I mean, I really, really love this bowl. Uh, this is, of course, with some vivid uh, colors. Um, this is more smoked, uh, smoke fired. Also very beautiful. But in my experience, these open forms, the bowls, are the most difficult to survive in pit fire. I'm not 100% sure why. I tried firing them upside down, that didn't help. I tried put them in the top and in the bottom, and uh, it's just a very high degree of, of, um, of breakage with the open forms. But of course, shouldn't keep you from doing it. It's just, uh, so you know, at least my experience with the open forms are not as good as the closed forms. So um, let's move on with some uh, throwing. I prepared a couple of clay balls, uh, I think about three kilo each or something, and we're going to make some, uh, some decent sized uh, vases. One of the most important things when throwing um, on top of the shapes as we just talked about is the uh, consistency. Because of the way that the, the pot is heated in a pit fire, very rapidly up, very rapidly down, I have a feeling that the um, unevenness in the thickness of the walls in the, in the bottom is makes it even more <laughs> likely to crack than, than in a in a more controlled uh, electric or gas fire. So um, you've got to be more precise and more, um, yeah, well, more careful uh, that, uh, that you don't have areas that are too thick or too thin. And of course for the bottom, I pay extra attention to getting it well compressed. Um, the walls will typically be compressed by the pulling and the shaping, so um, I'm not I'm not super concerned about that. But the bottom, I mean, I always compress the bottom a lot, but for the pit fired pots, I do it maybe even a bit more. Also, even though theoretically you can make things very thin uh, and get away with uh, pit fire. I tend not to make it as super thin as theoretically you could do. I'm not very good at doing very thin anyway, so, so it suits me well. So now we have like the basic shape of um, very classic shape of a vase. Um, I will have to take off a little bit down here. Um, I can take some of it now. Um, it's just that I like to have a little bit more clay than I need down here when I'm throwing because otherwise it, it tends to get too unstable. And this um, also because this clay is a little bit on the soft side. So. Um, if it was stiffer, then I wouldn't need it, but uh, I need it now. <laughs> Just be careful when you're when you're wet trimming. Um, you uh, you should uh, grab the clay that comes off the pot because otherwise it's going to stick to it. But um, wet trimming advantage is that um, whatever you trim off now don't need to dry, so um, essentially the, the whole drying process of, of the pot is going to go faster. So um, it's, only, it's only down here that I really need it. 
a bit on the shoulder. So. This is ready for, um, for drying. I'm gonna dry it maybe until tomorrow morning, something. And um, I want a soft leather heart because we're going to apply porcelain slip to it. And I want it as wet as possible. But I do need to trim it a little bit before we add um, the porcelain. Um, so um, it can't be completely wet like now. I can't trim it enough at this stage. Um, so as soft as possible, still being able to it. So um, let's do another one. So, that was uh, the second one in the buff clay, and uh, it's getting a little bit late now, so I think I may continue tomorrow with the last piece of buff clay and um, the 254, and then we will also do some in the red clay. Do you know that feeling when you sit down by the wheel and you suddenly feel like you lost all your throwing skills? <laughs> I had that feeling last night. Of course, you didn't. I didn't, but I was probably getting too tired. And the thing is, it actually requires a lot of concentration to do uh, wheel throwing. And so when you're out of focus, you're too tired or something, it can feel like you lost all your throwing skills. So then it's time to go to bed. I did, and now it's morning and I'm ready to throw again. So I'll do another one of the 254, the buff clay, before we move on to the red clay, the dark clay. Sometimes with bigger lumps of clay, it's difficult to judge the thickness of the bottom. Just use a potter's needle. This is uh, almost good because I want to throw a foot on this one. You see? I didn't lose all my throwing skills. <laughs> it's feeling much better today. So that's good to know. <laughs> Sleep on it, get back. I keep taking out uh, any, any water in, in the bottom. I don't want it to soak in there too long. Uh, it will weaken the whole pot and uh, make it more unstable. I still need just a little bit of water on the inside just to make sure that it's well lubricated. Sometimes when you get to a certain point and, and you can feel that you, you start to get tired, um, just relax, stop, um, reset the clay, and then um, continue where you left. It's no problem. It's getting better and better. <laughs> mm. 
At this point, I'm just trying to even out the walls, or the wall, because <laughs> it's uh, there's a few places where it's a little bit thicker than the rest. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I like the walls, especially for pit fire, to be as equally thick as possible. They should, of course, be a little bit thicker at the bottom to sustain the weight. And you can make them thinner in the top, but I mean, don't make it too much. So, I think this is the basic shape of this pot. I will, as I did last time, um, just do a little bit of wet trimming. I will take off a little bit down here, because I deliberately left a little bit too much there. And I know I should have better throwing skills, so I didn't need to do this, but um, that's how it is. And um, we all need to play with whatever skills we have. The most important thing is, all in all, the end result. And the good thing also about wet trimming is that this clay I can wet up and use again. So I, didn't need, I don't need to actually go through the whole reclaiming process of um, dealing with dried out uh, clay. I'm just going to use my um, metal whip to just smoothen the surface a little bit and make sure that there's no, um, no slip left on it. That's the most important because that will make it dry much slower. That's it. Now I'm going to let this one dry too and move on with uh, some of the red clay. So now I'm ready with the other kind of clay. And I'm not going to spend too much time, I'm going to edit it down with the throwing because basically it's the same thing. Same principles applies. Try to make the walls as even as possible and all that. So we're going to do a small base with this one. It's just a small uh, lump. But I will say, I love this clay. It is so nice to throw with it. Even though it's got 40% grok, it's very fine grok. So I think it feels like so smooth and nice. And then um, the color is beautiful for normal glaze work. But of course, now that we're going to pit fire, especially with this one, we're going to need the white slip. So um, let's throw this. This clay is also much easier to throw thinner. Um, and again, I'm not trying to make it super thin, but... So, that was almost it. <laughs> I'm just gonna take off some of the food here. So, I think this looks nice. And uh, now we're ready to dry the two. And, um, Next up, I will um, trim the parts that I did yesterday and then we're ready to apply the porcelain and finally the terracicolata. Now the parts have dried a little bit, actually a little bit too much, but uh, that's how it is with timing. I should have done it last night, but I was too tired. So now it's time to uh, trim them and uh, apply the, uh, the porcelain slip and see how that goes. I'm not going to uh, burnish this because if it's completely um, yeah, burnished and smooth, then, then it will be more difficult for the um, porcelain slip to stick. So I want it like when you're painting, you know, you, you, you grind a little bit, so there's a little bit of friction um, for the paint to stick. And that's sort of the same principle with, um, with the porcelain slip. So I'm just gonna scrape it like this. Not put it flat, but like this angle, 
straight to it. So so we get a little bit of um, a rough surface. Not very much, just a little bit. I got this really nice, very small one. It's very, very good for, um, for areas around your neck. Here's my bucket of slip uh, porcelain, um, watered down. I first I dried the porcelain, it was uh, trimmed from uh, my porcelain work, and then it watered down. And as you see, it looks a little bit gray. And I think it's due to um, some molding, um, but it is super white when it's fired. So I'm hoping that <laughs> it will um, turn out that uh, Usually molding is just an organic material that will fly away. So, Let's hope for that. It's always a little bit tricky when you want to apply um, slip on a on a vertical surface like this. It could just fall off. But I hope uh, this slip is uh, stiff enough <laughs> to apply it. So let's see how it goes. I don't want too much. I just want enough to um, to cover it and um, and turn it white. I'm trying to get this as smooth as possible because the next layer, the terciolata, is super thin. So every little, uh, any little crack or any little, you know, inconsistency will show through the terciolata. So now I think this one is good. Um, I'm going to let it dry now. And before I can apply the terciolata, it has to be bone dry, so completely dry. Uh, actually, ready for uh, the big fire. We'll get back to that. So I'm going to put this back on my drying shelves and uh, move on with the next one. This one is also going to be trimmed, but uh, just so you, in the end, <laughs> can see the difference, I'm not going to apply a porcelain slip to this one, but only the terciolata, the super white terciolata that I made. And so we can see the difference between having that middle layer of porcelain and not on a bath clay. Unlike the other part where we put the porcelain on, uh, I would like this to be more smooth because the tear cigalata is not actually sticking, it's soaking into the little hole in the, in the pot. So it actually, it actually works okay to have it a little more um, smooth. I wouldn't say furnished because that's what we do with the tear cigalata, but still, you know, I'm using uh, the metal grip like this and just press in the, 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 the grok into the clay so you get a little more of a smooth and Sort of shiny surface. And remember, this is um, the last part before the tear cigalata. And so, um, the, because the tear cigalata is so fine particles, um, everything is going to show. So, um, I don't want any, um, any rough edges, any little crumbles or anything. So, I'm just making sure that the surface is completely smooth because that's going to look the best with the tear cigalata applied. So I think this is okay. So move that to the drying shelf. Again, it needs to be completely bone dry before I apply the tear cigalata. This is the last one of um, the buff clay ones and um, I'm gonna trim this too. It needs a lot of trimming in the foot because of the height, I, I needed more, more thickness down there. So I can take a lot and uh, I'm going to apply the porcelain to this one too. So we're going to have two of the buff ones with porcelain and tear cigalata, and one of them only with the tear cigalata. So now I'm just checking that um, the walls have even thickness. You know, even though that it's been drying a little more than I wanted, now that I remove all this, um, this clay and the trimming, it's uh, getting into the more soft, a little hard stage, which is perfect for what we want to do. I think the shape and everything is good now. So um, I just want to, um, to 
to smoothen it with um, my metal whip. And again, I'm not trying to burnish it because we need to apply the the porcelain slip. So um, I'm just trying to um, smooth it and leave a sort of like a grinded uh, surface. And as you see now that I'm pushing it around and I cut the, um, the foot here, it's getting a little bit wobbly, but it's okay. I mean, when you stop it, it looks fine. It's just when you turn it around. <laughs> I think this is ready to um, apply the porcelain slip. On this part, to make it even more smooth, um, to prepare for the terciglata, I'm gonna try something different. I'm gonna very, very gently add this to smoothen out the, um, the porcelain. Very, very gently. I don't wanna apply any pressure because I don't, I don't want to um, scrape it off, of course. And that works really well. As you see, it's very little that I scraped off. Yeah, I think this looks really, really good. So now it's time for this to um, dry and um, get ready for the terciglata. The last one is the dark clay, the red clay. And this is definitely going to have um, the porcelain slip because as we discussed in the beginning, this uh, actually fires and this fire to a very dark red and that's too dark a surface for pit fire at least for what I mostly like to do as you saw you could get away with it with strong colorants but now we're going to try and add this um, more light um, and as I said when I was drawing this um, it's much easier to throw this clay uh, thinner and um, the other stoneware. So um, I don't need to trim this as much. Got a little bit of uneven <laughs> top here, but I guess it's okay. Oops, this one actually <laughs> got loose. Um, this is what happens with these beds. It's actually um, loosen itself, <laughs> which is nice in a way, but also can be <laughs> a problem when you're in the middle of the trim. So now I'm ready to apply the porcelain slip. Don't worry too much if you get a little bit over the edge on the, um, on the rim. Um, it's very easy to remove. I'm just, to begin with, focused on getting an even layer all over the pot. No, um, no holes, no spots where the clay shine through. So again, for this one, I'm just gonna smoothen it with um, my metal rib. Just wanna make sure this is completely clean because if there's any any little dry materials here, um, of course it will drag um, stripes. Mm -hmm. 
the last thing I will do is just to clean up this. Um, I think this is good. Yeah, that's it. Now I'm going to put this for drying. And the next step is to apply to a ladder. But that will be in a couple of days. So um, see you soon. Now the pots have completely dried. It's bone dry and are ready to apply the terracicolata. But before I do that, I just want to go over them to see if uh, the porcelain that I applied is smooth enough. And for this one, it's not entirely smooth. I would like it to be just a little bit more smooth. To do that, I'll just go over it with a metal whip and scrape very, very gently, because I don't want to scrape off all the um, uh, porcelain but I do want to make sure that it's uh, smooth and nice. See, I think that's all. It took maybe a little bit more here. Yeah, that feels good. Remember, with the pit fire, we don't add any glaze, so we don't get that smooth, nice, uh, um, feeling uh, from the from the melted glaze. Instead, we're going to have the surface we're going to make now. There's nothing else. I think it's nice now. It's still got a little bit of bumps. I can see if I can I can sort of press it into. Um, but uh, oh, have to be careful <laughs> because I didn't secure it. But I think it is good enough. Of course, there's a lot of dust on it right now. So I want to get rid of that before I apply the Terzigalata. Otherwise, these little dust particles may create a, a bumpy surface. And of course, you need a completely clean uh, sponge for that. And don't use too much water, because we don't want to soak it now that it's all dry. We just want to make sure that um, there's no dust on it. That should be fine. I'm going to put this aside and take the other ones before we move on with the Terzigalata. This one too could use a little bit of smoothing, so I'm going to go ahead with that. Same procedure. Yeah, that feels good now. So again, with my damped um, brush here, just um, lightly um, get room, get, get the... <laughs> The, the dust removed, that's what it's called. <laughs> the other two pots are fine. One of them, remember, I didn't add any pollen to, and the last one is just nice by itself. And now we're ready to apply the Terzigalata. The Terzigalata that I'm gonna use is the second version of my Terzigalata. I will put links to um, how I made this. But basically, instead of just normal tensing ladder where you have some clay that you water down and, and siphon it, I have added a little bit of EPK and that makes it wider. And uh, you could also add some titanium, but I didn't do it because I tested this and it is actually super wide. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead with that. It will settle a little bit when you have it sitting uh, in, your, in your pocket, but it's not that bad. Um, so I usually just use my hand. There's no, there's no toxic chemicals in this. It's just pure clay, a little bit of porcelain, the EPK, and that's it. You just make sure that there's no lumps or anything in it. Occasionally, you may need to um, to filter it if if some lumps for whatever reason comes in there. But this is good, and have to be just super watery. It have a very low specific gravity, so there's very little dry materials in this and very fine particle. It's only about a specific gravity of 1.15. That works well. So now I'm just going to clean my hands and then we're ready to go. I usually use one of these white Chinese brushes. You can use anything, but I just want something where the hairs are not falling off. <laughs> and um, I want something that can contain a lot of uh, the tears and ladder. Makes it easier. Then I'm just going to spin it uh, slowly um, and add the first layer. Just make sure that nothing is dripping, because if you have any drips um, falling down the sides or anything, it will be visible on the final pot. So it's better to put too little at a time than too much, um, 
you can always add another layer. The goal is to get a smooth uh, layer. And I can see this funny thing, the same thing with this, maybe it's uh, the weather or something that have molded the, the, the EPK, the porcelain, because it's also got a little bit of a yellow tint. I'm not afraid of that, because if it is, which it's most likely it is, some organic uh, material like, like molding or something, it will, it will burn away. And left will be the white Teosicolata. I'm just going to add a little bit more before I do the first uh, burnishing. So I'm sure that everything is covered. And now comes the part of, um, of burnishing it. And there's so many ideas for how to do that. What, what I found is that the easiest way to do it is just to use a pair of cheap uh, gloves. These are polyester, and I think I got them from H&M. <laughs> Cheap gloves like this just works wonder. And it's so much easier and faster than using uh, plastic or tools or whatever you use. I'll show you. Just gonna get them on first, of course. <laughs> and you basically just hold on very lightly and just uh, let your hand slip through it. I don't know if you can see it, but it's really getting shiny. You gotta do it at the right stage, so it have to be dry, but not completely dry. If it's too dry, you can't um, you can't polish it like this or burnish it like this. And if it's too wet, oh, we're just gonna smudge it all over. I think even on the video you can see now that it's much more shiny than it was before. And then, um, so I think it's going well. So, I will add another layer of the Tears of Lada. I think that looks good. And I'm ready with my gloves again. The more <clears throat> the more layers you add, uh, the more of the color of the Tiersigalada you will get. So even if you didn't have uh, any um, any porcelain, you could still turn it white with enough of the Tiersigalada. However, <laughs> the thicker the layer of the Tiersigalada the more risky it is, in my experience, to flake off, either during a bisque fire or pit fire. I don't know how well this shows on the video, but it is super shiny now, and uh, this is gonna come out really well in the pit fire. That is, if it doesn't flake off, <laughs> explode or anything. But I think this is gonna be good. One thing to keep in mind is, uh, at this stage, if you touch it with your bare hands, there's a big risk that you're gonna leave finger marks and they're gonna go all the way through to your final pot. So if you don't want that, you could wear the same gloves that you used to uh, polish it. That's not gonna leave any marks. I'm not gonna show you how I do the other two with porcelain because it's basically the same, but I will show you how it's gonna look with the one without porcelain. So let's do that one. This one is already super smooth. Um, remember we made it without the porcelain, so it's just the lightly burnished uh, surface that we have now. So it's ready to um, apply the tearsing ladder. What is difficult to see at this stage is um, how much wider it's going to turn. Um, but uh, trust me, <laughs> it will. <laughs> I know this by experience. And um, after we're done and it's fired, um, you will be able to see the difference um, because we're only applying the Teresigalata on the outside. So um, if we turn it around, uh, you will be able to see the color at the bottom. And that's going to be dramatically different. Oh, see here, I actually got a little bit of a drip. Let's see if I can save it. Yeah, I think I did. 
because those drips, if you have any any Jessica ladder running, it's gonna go all the way to the final pot. So we don't want that. So now I'm ready for the first burnishing. And just keep it very, very lightly. You don't need to push. Um, and if you push too much, you're just gonna push it off the wheel. <laughs> but it's such a magical feeling when you do this. I think you can you can see it in the video too. I can see it here. Um, how much it shines up when I do this. Um, so from this uh, matte, uh, bone dry surface of the pure clay, um, we now got this really shiny surface. I'm just gonna give it one more layer, I think. Yeah, that looks good. And uh, I know right now the color doesn't seem that different, um, but um, when this is fired, it's gonna be much wider than the pure clay. It's gonna it's sort of like a boring, buffy, <laughs> uh, grayish color. It's not um, it's not one of my favorites. And uh, we do get better results, um, especially when when you're using organic materials in the pit fire that is not very strong colors. Um, a white surface just seems to produce more um, strong results. So, I think you can see it here. Look how shiny it is. It is super nice. So now, we're ready for the next stage. One of the most common questions I get is, do you bisque fire your pots before pit fire? And yes, I do. And I primarily do it because putting this in a, a, a pit, in my barrel, as I use here, and stacking it and putting wood on top is very risky. Things fall down, wood falls down, they fall down on each other, and because it's not bisfired yet, it's very fragile. So bisfiring it will secure that it's more strong when I put it in the pit. Also, it's a way to control that, that uh, the clay um, turns into stronger ceramics, not just for the pit fire, but also for the use afterwards. So I think it's a more secure way of doing it. I think theoretically you could get away with um, pit firing uh, on bisque <laughs> where I know that they do it for, um, I had a small video uh, the other day and this, um, about this Danish uh, 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 smoke fired pots we call Jule potter. And they use uh, uh, raw clay when they fire, but again, they don't stack them. So um, it's a little more under control. But for the way that I fire, I definitely always uh, bisfire them. Also, what I found is that dealing with tear cigar can be tricky. Uh, worst case, it can flake off either in the bis fire or even look fine in the bis fire and then flake off in the pit fire. What I found is that if I bis fire a little bit of a higher temperature, the higher the temperature, the more secure the tear cigar is going to be. But the higher the temperature, the less glossy. So I have to, you have to find whatever trade-off works for you. In my case, it works to find them to a thousand degrees Celsius. I also know um, potters that are doing a pit fire that uh, fire them even higher. They fire them up to vitrification temperature, whatever that is for your clay. That is, uh, especially when you when you want to use it for, um, for, for kitchenware, plates, bowls, and so on. It serves a purpose to have your clay completely vitrified. However, keep in mind that if the clay is vitrified, the, the, the weaker colors is not going to attach itself as strong because the, the pores in the clays are more closed. Uh, but I think I found a good trade-off with a thousand degrees because now I don't have any flaking off of my, um, of my tear cigalata, but I uh, still have enough open pores to um, have the, the colors from the fuming uh, get into the clay. So um, let's move on with the... Uh, Bisque fire, and then I'll see you when it's done. Good morning, and welcome to the Danish summer. <laughs> we had some really nice and warm days, but now it's raining. That's just how it is in Denmark. We got used to it. The kiln is now cold enough to open, and I want to remind you again, please wait. 
There's no reason to open your kiln when it's too warm. You can't touch the pots. There's a risk that they will crack. If it's a glaze fire, maybe the glaze will mess up. And you put a burden on your, on your heating elements, so it will last less time. Please wait. I know <laughs> the only good reason to open it early is impatience. I have that too, but uh, it's much better for everything to just wait. I got used to now wait a long time, actually, just an extra day or something. And now it's only 20 degrees, so about no room outside temperature. So it's easy to touch the pots and empty it, and it's safe. So let's go see how it looks. Ah, first look is always important and it looks good. Nothing exploded <laughs> and uh, it looks like all the porcelain survived and didn't flake off at all. In fact, it looks really, really good. So let's go inside and take a closer look. I'm very happy because they all survived. There's no cracking. There's no flaking off of the porcelain or the tersicolata. Now I don't know if you remember which of the pots I did what to. This one may be the easiest one because that's the red, the dark red clay. And then, as you can see, um, the porcelain and the tersicolata have survived perfectly. So um, it looks really, really good. <laughs> and this sort of defeats all the rules because the shrinkage rate between the porcelain and the stoneware is crazy. The porcelain is about 20% and the stoneware is about 10% and yet it's smooth, it's perfect, no crackles, nothing. So it is indeed possible. And if you look at this other one, this is um, the buff clay that I didn't put um, any, uh, any porcelain on. And you can see the difference here. This is without the tear cigalata, and this is with the tear cigalata. I don't know how, how clear it is on the video, but this is this is grayish buff, it's um, kind of a dull color, and this is clear white. But if you see the difference between those two, there is a difference. This one is definitely wider. It's always difficult on video, but if I look at them, this one looks more blue grayish. And this one definitely looks very clear white. It's not a dramatic difference. I mean, this one clearly have a very good white surface too. And it's going to be beautiful when, uh, when we apply whatever materials I'm going to apply for the, for the pit fire. But this one is just a little more white. And for this red clay, I tried uh, just adding the tear And even though I added two or three layers, it just didn't turn out this white. So if you have clays that are dark or just not very interesting, or you know, too dull, too, too dark for, for pit fire, definitely try and add that uh, layer of um, porcelain before you add the tessic ladder. The other two also came out perfect. Here you can see how the difference is actually bigger because here we have the porcelain and this is the original buff uh, clay. So you can see here is actually a bigger difference. So the porcelain does something. And, um, and this one is uh, nice and light too. Um, also with the buff uh, clay, but with porcelain and tear One thing I will say though is that I should probably spend a little more time trying to smooth it a little bit more because there are a few stripes of the porcelain, but together with the, with the it's, it's still super shiny and, 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 and nice, the surface is perfect, but it's just uh, together with, with a more dramatic um, application of colors for the pit fire, I think it will actually look really nice, but I would also like to be able to do it completely smooth. And this have some, some, some drawing lines almost, some, some, um, some small lines. I don't think you can actually see it on the video. It is very subtle. So um, I'm happy. And uh, this was the first stage on the road to um, pit fire. We uh, found the right clay. I told you how to throw it what to be careful about with the even sized walls and stuff, and how to apply the, the, the porcelain and the tersic ladder. So next step is to fire. And I'm gonna get back to you on that. So I just hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please remember to subscribe and share and comment. I love all your comments, 
good and bad, whatever. Maybe you have some suggestions for things I can do better. In any case, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, next Sunday, I have another video coming up, usually around 5 p.m. Central European time. So I just hope to see you there. Have a great day. Thank you.